as we transition the, the third panel up, I um, want to just, a couple of people on the second panel mentioned uh, a few companies, and, and those companies are going to be represented on the third panel to talk about the, the great innovation that's happening within the supply chain. So to moderate this panel, uh, very excited to be able to introduce uh, Dennis McLaren. Dennis is a, was appointed by uh, Senator, uh, President Obama uh, to serve as the regional administrator in uh, Region 10. And uh, Region 10 covers Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, and about 271 tribal governments uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Dennis, Dennis previously served as the Puget Sound Clean Air Energy Director and uh, was somebody that adopted and enforced air quality standards uh, throughout Washington. So uh, Dennis, in the third panel, I'd, I'd like to welcome you all uh, up, to the, uh, up to the stage. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna get uh, right into it here. So uh, let's uh, welcome our uh, champions of uh, supply chain innovation. And uh, we've got a great panel today. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Carpenter, the Director of Business Development and Consulting from Waste Management. Uh, Tom leads both the business development and uh, consulting department for Waste Management Sustainable Sustainability uh, Services Division, and uh, this professional business unit works uh, with clients to uncover resource value in all along their supply chain, in many cases enabling them to realize uh, significant cost savings. And uh, also with us today, uh, we've got uh, Drew Patey, the Director of Safety Clean Motorsports, and uh, Drew is the Director of Safety Clean Sports and serves the manager of the Safety Clean NASCAR partnership. And Drew oversees the collection of all the oils, automotive waste, and fluids used at every sanctioned NASCAR race, the length and breadth of the country. And uh, we also have uh, with us today uh, Mary Ann Bidscom from uh, uh, Coca-Cola Recycling. Uh, she's the Director of Marketing at Coca-Cola Recycling, and she has more than 30 years of experience in marketing, sales, and management of the Coca-Cola system. And she began her career in 1978 at the Coca-Cola bottling of uh, Miami as a sales representative, uh, calling on small chain and independent customers, and later managing teams of salespeople, route drivers, and merchandisers. And uh, uh, just a few remarks to get us started. Uh, with the panel. This has been a great day today uh, with uh, very powerful stories and uh, you guys can't imagine how much fun it is for uh, an EPA guy to really be in the room with folks who are uh, competing uh, to be greener, to outgreen each other and uh, the powerful tools that you guys have been sharing, it's, it's just great fun for me and uh, I'm a big sports fan, I'm decidedly uh, an amateur athlete myself, unfortunately, but uh, it's great to uh, share these powerful stories and these experiences uh, with you guys. Uh, uh, I agree uh, that uh, uh, you guys are very much in the entertainment uh, industry and uh, making this as fun as possible for your fan base. Uh, I mean, that's what it's all about, getting those fans there to show them a good time and to experience a, a great day at your venues. Uh, and so uh, making this fun is a, a really important aspect of this. But I have to say it's very fun for me to be associated with you folks. And it's very fun to see uh, some of our branding and tools from EPA being used by you in developing these programs. It's, it's really important for us to see uh, that you're measuring things, that you're using metrics, that uh, you're then competing using those tools and those metrics, and, and that's a great uh, aspect of this. So um, with that, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'm particularly excited about uh, the, some of the fan engagement pieces of this, but this panel is really here to talk about the supply chain side of things uh, to help enable and empower uh, the teams and, and the venues to have some of the successes that you've got. And so we're going to, without further ado, jump right into some of the questions here. And uh, uh, so I think uh, for all my panel members, uh, this first question applies to each of you. Uh, how have changes within the sports industry and committed efforts to go green impacted your business models? And has this new demand for uh, green 
supply, supply chain uh, incentives. Uh, how has that impacted uh, growth and innovation in your companies? Um, I'll kick it off, I guess, and just say it really helped to accelerate our efforts. Um, at Coca-Cola, we've got a 2020 goal that says we're going to recover the equivalent of our footprint. Put a lot of bottles and cans out in the marketplace and a lot of material. Um, so having that goal helped us to, um, having the goal, having the teams uh, come together really helped us to accelerate that. And it really started for us with NASCAR. Uh, Mike Lynch was up here earlier, got Drew here, but um, it really started with us with NASCAR. Our, our team was formed um, at Coca-Cola Recycling, which is a separate group within the company. And our goal is to figure out how to do that. And we only can do that if we raise recycling rates. And I had to go, I had to call somebody from our DC office because I was dying of thirst. But when it comes to recycling, um, we kind of don't care about that. If you've ever been to a NASCAR race, and there's, I think there's a few people in been in here to a NASCAR race. A lot of turns, right? Um, a lot of beer cans out there, a lot of other things other than just our products. So for us, it's about raising overall recycling rates. Um, in educating consumers along the way to do that. And obviously, we've got a powerful brand. Um, we talked earlier about some of the sports teams. Those are powerful brands, right? Um, I'm a Rangers fan, too, if that makes, makes a difference. Um, Rangers, Knicks, Yankees. Um, but it's really about taking the power of all that and pulling it together, OK? And that's one of the things we've done. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we educate consumers. But those are some of the fun things that come along the way um, with working back with the teams and, and working back across that. So, Drew, how about you? Well, the, uh, the sports business and, uh, and recycling, I think it's great. We've been recycling since the late 60s. We built our, um, we built our company around recycling, and we use, the, um, you know, we use sports and entertainment, not only NASCAR, but also IndyCar racing and NHRA drag racing. As, you know, all the, all the motorsports are my responsibility. But uh, you know, with the, the heightened awareness of going green, it's made my job so much easier. Okay, the, uh, the four-year-olds that give the, the lectures at home, super, love it. The more, you know, the more oil I can collect, the more oil we can sell. That's what we do. We, uh, you know, I'm the business guy here in the room, and you know, my job is to collect as much oil as we possibly can, along with Marty and Elliot, who are, have joined me today. And uh, you know, the more awareness we can bring to, to the green movement, the better off we are. You know, and uh, at, you know, at, at our stadium level, it, Brandon's racetrack in, in Pocono, Pennsylvania, where we'll go in two weeks. You know, he's out in front. He's promoting his green initiative, which helps my business. So that's uh, you, you just can't say you just can't say enough about that. And the uh, the awareness and what we do at the racetrack is our core business. And what we do there, you know, at the racetrack, and, you know, is 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 exactly what we do in you know in stadiums or at the. Coca-Cola plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where they recycle the uh, all the, you know, all the plastic, and the uh, and the cans, and as long and as as well as at the Ford Motor Company, and you know, and General Electric. So, the more the more effort we can all get out for green, the better off we are. Great. How about you, Tom? Uh, what about uh, uh, innovation and, and your business models? Yeah, so, so you know, much like uh, safety, clean waste management's been uh, in the recycling business for years. And you know this greening effort. Um, you know we've been green for years and helping companies do just that. Um, what I've seen within waste management is just an uptick of of being that that partner in looking at solutions. And when it really started out, it was more of a back of dock thinking and helping with you know maybe recycling more. But today, with being you know our expertise in all avenues of sustainability, whether it be energy and water and our zero waste practice. We've seen an uptick of you know the the event that we co-sponsor with the, the the Phoenix Open and really using that as a benchmark, but that's you know translated into the helping the rest of the PGA and many other tournaments. It's helped to you know uh, advance the the Olympic Trials Marathon in Houston this year and it, and making just design improvements and in helping each one of the major sports stadiums make those improvements going upstream and looking at you know, all the materials that are coming in the facility and not just looking at just recycling of plastic bottles and other things, but it's looking at, you know, those technologies that we could bring to bear with organics recycling or diversion and so on. Great. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's do some individual questions now and, and maybe we'll start with you, Tom. Uh, uh, we all know uh, about recycling bins. Uh, they're undoubtedly uh, the most, one of the most visible aspects of what everybody sees uh, from waste management and other companies like yours. Uh, 
when fans see these bins, uh, these recognizable bins scattered throughout their ballparks, it can be a pretty powerful symbol. Uh, how have Waste Management's partnerships with uh, sports leagues and teams worked to increase fan awareness and participation in these screening initiatives? Yeah, we, we've spoken a lot about the fans and, and kind of the engagement aspect. Um, you know, the previous panel highlighted kind of the energy improvements, and from a stadium perspective, that's where you're going to find the most uh, cost savings. But when you look at it that from the energy perspective, you could put in, you know, retrofit the lighting, put in the occupancy sensors. But recycling is such a behavioral engagement. It's an engagement of the fans, and they see that. There's been many a sports stadiums that have gone and looked at LEED certification, but if their recycling program, their diversion program is lacking, that's, that's the tangible piece that the fan really engages. So, uh, you know, I, I heard somebody mention earlier, it's not as simple as throwing out recycling containers and expecting everybody to, to adopt that. So we've really raised that, the bar with that and look at, uh, you know, just, just the collection of those materials, you know, how is it easier for maybe your janitorial service or what, whatever, how is it easy for that fan to just walk a few more steps and they have the choice of recycling or throwing it away? Um, we raised the bar and really kind of, you know, delving into that at the Phoenix Open this year. We didn't have any trash containers at, at the, the event. This is an event that serves, services more than a half a million people, and they only had two choices. They could recycle or they could throw it in an organics recycling bin. So those two choices allowed us to really raise the bar there to where we were able to achieve over a 97% diversion rate and really set that bar higher. What we've done is kind of take that thought leadership, looked at the waste conveyance and how we kind of manage the input. So we looked at, you know, only allowing materials that could be recycled or could be composted into the facility or into the venue. And we take that same nature and that same, you know, idea and parlay that into, you know, the way we, we help other sports stadiums or venues or events because it's really that impact you know there's many things out there that we want to recycle but when you get contamination when you have fans that make the wrong choice it makes it much more difficult on the operations side and, and at the end of the day when a fan does see maybe those recyclables in the wrong container it kind of taints the image it, it, it hurts the brand within so when Waste Management puts our brand out there, we want to be more than just kind of a logo and a sponsor out there. We want to be that partner and really look at, you know, the, the bin strategy that you have. I, I heard the liners earlier, the color coding and so on. There's not one standard out there. So it really needs to be uh, visible, impactful. Um, at the Phoenix Open, we used what we called recycling ambassadors that stood by and explained to uh, uh, the patrons, the fans, as they came up. There was messaging on jumbotrons and, and other things at other stadiums during kind of those, instead of having a seventh inning stretch, there's, a, there's another period where uh, fans can recycle all the materials and it's very active and engaging in that. So I think it, it's, it's definitely when, when, when sports venues really embrace it as a strategy and really have a plan of, of engaging the fans, it can be very powerful, much the way we've heard today. Great, thanks Tom. So, Drew, let's, let's keep with the fan base theme here for a second. Uh, in what ways is uh, Safety Clean working with NASCAR to promote the sustainability uh, uh, model amongst its large fan base? Well, we do, we do a number of different things. We, um, um, what we do at the racetracks, like, when, I set up, when I came to Safety Clean in 1992, they, um, they didn't have a universal uh, recycling program in motorsports. So, I convinced Safety Clean, I was working at another race team, convinced Safety Clean to put together this program to where we would go recycle all the used fluids and we would do it universally throughout all of all of motorsports. So of course we started with NASCAR first, being the you know the biggest, you know, the eight hundred pound gorilla in the you know in the industry. But we've since br you know, branched out to IndyCar racing, to NHR drag racing and to uh, um, you know to supercross, the monster trucks. All those, you know, all those events, now you will see safety clean recycling stations there to where the competitors go and, and dump all their oil there. They know we're here, they know we're, you know, they know the same color, you know, bins are, you know, are there all the time, so they go to it. Then what we do is, we don't charge any of the, any of the racetracks. I don't charge Brandon, Brandon doesn't charge me for being on site, okay? 
um, we traded. I found that early on, well, Brandon does charge me for those tickets that he sold me last week. <laughs> <laughs> he did charge, and he asked me if I got a deal when I told him that earlier today, and I went, no, I didn't. Could I have got, gotten a deal? <laughs> the, first, the first deal I got. But um, the, the fan involvement comes in two forms that, that I see. The one is the, is the NASCAR fan. And to your question about the, uh, the logo and the decal, okay, you'll see decals on race cars, logos on patches of, of uh, race, you know, driver's uniforms. I trade the services at the race team for that. I don't charge them, they don't charge me. Once you open the Pandora's box of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of, of paying an athlete, where's my friend over there, I was sitting next to you, you can probably never get away from paying him more and more money. So, because he is pretty good at what he does. So anyway, he'll definitely tell me that he's pretty good at what he does. So anyway, if you, you know, that's the, the, that's the business model we, you know, we have found. The, as, is, you know, and that transcend, that gets you into the fan base. The other way that gets you into, into the fan base is, and we've done this in many different you know, venues, and that is, you bring your oil, bring your oil filter to the racetrack, okay? We're gonna give you a, a ticket. We're gonna give you a Friday ticket, a qualifying ticket. We did this as early as when? Oh, when your grandfather and I did this back in 1993 or four. At, at, at Pocono, we, we have continued to do this. Builds, you know, builds, you know, builds enthusiasm over being green. Put some more bodies into the stadiums, into the arenas. You sell more hot dogs and hamburgers. I was once taught by Bruton Smith that an empty seat never bought a beer. <laughs> never. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this helps sell tickets, and it's about it's about selling tickets. It's about doing you know doing the right thing, and that's how we've you know we've really transcended into the fan area. Great. Well, uh, let's go to Marianne and let's uh, stay with the, the, uh, like the, trade the customers and, like and the fans. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, you've got one of the most recognizable brands in the world uh, with Coca-Cola. The, the most recognizable. Yes. <laughs> There's that competitiveness again. Let me sit back here for a second. And uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, in what ways is Coca-Cola Recycling partnering with sports stadiums and, and venues to educate uh, customers on the benefits of recycling? And what do you see as the biggest benefit to consumer education with that powerful brand that you have? Well, I, I think it's twofold. One is um, our group was put together to help um, go out to these venues and, and big events and things that we're associated with as a company and make sure that if our products are going to be there, that there's a real recycling program going on there. I think somebody earlier mentioned greenwashing. Um, we're not about greenwashing, so we want to make sure that there is that. A lot of the guys that were here on the panel before me and gals, um, they have great, great programs, right? So how do we make those better is one step. Uh, in fact, we just got the Eagles, so we're excited about that. Um, but there are a lot of venues we go to that don't have programs in place. Um, NASCAR would be a great example. Started about four years ago. We've got 10,000 recycling bins at NASCAR tracks across North America. Um, you can't do anything. You can't educate anybody unless you have a bin to stick it in, right? And the critical part is it's in the right place. Um, Tom mentioned um, contamination, right? It's got to be in the right place. And I've seen messaging all over the board. It's not about sponsorships and logos. It's about a call to action. So the second part of that is we developed a call to action. So um, we have a, pro, a campaign called Give It Back. Drink the Coke, recycle the bottle. Pretty simple campaign. Uh, but Give It Back for us is a consumer call to action. And that's basically what it does, and that's basically what it says. And then we look at our marketing within a stadium. So if we've got a sponsorship, it's really for pouring rights, right? We're about selling Coke. We also put bottles and cans in people's hands. We want to make sure if they have the, the opportunity to do something with that bottle and can, because quite frankly, we need it back on the other end. We need to make new bottles and cans. So we're a buyer on the other end, and that's part of what our team does as well. So if you take all that and put it together, and you look at the things that we have within a stadium, um, so many of, the, many of the meetings that I'm at is bringing together folks like the, the team that was on the panel before me, the marketing folks, the folks that we deal with in terms of porridge rights, the folks we deal with in terms of concessionaires, et cetera. It's all about us all coming together. But it's important for us, and that's what our team brings to the party, is um, to make sure that if we're going to be involved, that we're going to do it right. And then what are all the things we can bring to the party? So from a 360 marketing standpoint, it's every place that we sell our product, right? It's things like PSAs with NASCAR drivers. If you, if you know a NASCAR, um, uh, one of our Coke NASCAR drivers or 
uh, you've been to the Oriole Stadium or you've been to Turner Field, you'll hear a, an athlete talk about, you know, recycle the Coke. I mean, drink the Coke, recycle the bottle, right? You stand there next to a recycling bin. He's telling his fan base to go do that, or her fan base to go do that, right? We now have Danica Patrick. Um, so we want to make sure we, we get that in. Um, but it's important to do that, and it's important to drive that message um, through all the different means that we have, and that's really the power of the brand, so the power of what we do. And we don't just do it at, at tracks. So we've got uh, recycling centers in Dallas, our reimagined platform where people can bring their containers to it, and we've been able to figure out how to bounce those folks back to TMS, Texas Motor Speedway, and back to uh, Texas Rangers, right? So to incorporate in, that into the marketing we do in the facility, um, as well as take folks that are outside the facility and send them in. You can't make any money if you don't get the butts and seats, right? right? You just said that. So there we go. So how do you, how do you begin to educate folks and, and, and bring all the different pieces to bear? And I think the, the piece that's most exciting for us um, in the early, first question you asked was about collaboration. And it's really about, if I think back to when our team was formed about four years ago, it was really folks from the aluminum industry that we, our suppliers that we deal with. It's the folks that sell us our, our packaging. It's all those kind of folks, right? But if you said, and I'll, I'll use one of our suppliers, it happens to be Ball Container who makes our cans. If you said, go recycle your ball, you wouldn't exactly know what you meant. But if you said, go recycle your Coke can, you got that, right? So it's really about putting a brand on things, and then it's about trying to find those folks that people are really passionate about, and athletes kind of fit into that um, more so than some of us, and we're all kind of sideline athletes, right? Um, but it's really about using, finding that somebody that can get that message out, right? And you can get it out in a lot of different ways. We've got recycling education vehicles that travel all over North America. We're at every NASCAR race every weekend. And what we do, in the, what we do is we educate folks about aluminum and plastic and, and uh, corrugated recycling. We make it fun, right? So you can, uh, Jennifer's laughing there because we've had it over at Staples. Um, but they get prizes, right? They get things made of recycled content. Last year alone, we did enough t-shirts within our system. We did a million bottles were, were flipped back into t-shirts. Pretty simple, not too hard. Buy a t-shirt, make it out of cotton, make it out of recycled PET, right? So it's educating people about what you can make into, into uh, what products you can make. All those things kind of coming back around to education. If you tell people that they can, this bottle can turn into to another product, uh, gets them excited. Um, we do a lot of work with, uh, with youth and schools, obviously, and kids, the four and a half year old that comes home, right? Um, but it's really about educating people about um, the entire food chain, so to speak, right? But it starts with um, you know, the hard work that these guys were talking about earlier, right? So how do we get everybody up to that is really about educating the other operators um, and helping to do that through the means that we have as well. So um, we're here for the long haul, so it's important to us. All right, thanks, Marianne. So let's go back to Tom with another question. Uh, waste management's uh, been uh, an integral part in many of these uh, efforts uh, to put uh, green initiatives into the sports industry. And uh, how about sharing uh, what some of your biggest uh, successes have been, and, and on the other side, the flip side of that, what are some of the biggest challenges? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I already mentioned you know, one of our keynote successes with the, the Waste Management Phoenix Open, but beyond that, you know, working with Alan um, with the NCAA um, you know, Final Four tournament when, back in 2011, it was in Houston, Texas, and really becoming kind of a, that collaborative partner. So, you know, the event itself, we wanted to raise the bar, increase uh, the amount of recycling. I think it was like 600 plus additional recycling containers were placed to really start to capture more. And really looking at outside, you know, what are some of those other materials, uh, you know, organics or food materials that can be donated. Um, you know, there was tree planting that went on with that. There was an e-waste event for the community that, that attracted. So it's, so it's those things that we look at successes. Um, a number of the stadiums that we've already mentioned out here, we've been active participants in, in conducting, you know, lead certification, waste assessments, or looking at upstream at what is the, the characterization of the materials that they are throwing away and what's the value in that. Um, you know, really, it's it's seeing those those avenues, and then branching out into 
um, you know, these, these week-long events or one-day events. You know, we have the Olympics coming up, and that's a big, large intensive where you do have the stage. But you also have all these trials and other events that happen. Uh, we were part of the, the U.S. Olympic trials and the Houston Mar Marathon. So it was two marathons set over two days. You had the Olympic trials and all the, the fans and participation within that. And then the next day you had the, the, the normal uh, Houston Marathon. And, and you know they, they had achieved good diversion rates and recycling rates, but it, it's looking at that venue and, and then capturing the, the organics, the recycling, and we were able to not only like donate all the, the clothing and stuff that's usually discarded at, you know in the mornings it's, it's rather cold when you're, when you're getting ready for your marathon. And there's you know thousands upon thousands. I think I, the number I have is over 3,000 pieces of clothing that were donated to the local community. We've done shoe drives and other things that kind of give back. So you know it, it's broader than kind of just the engagement of the community. It's kind of giving back within that, and then also achieving those those larger than normal recycling rates. So you know right out of the gate, 87% for for the marathon was diverted. And then we were close to, to 90%. So it's setting those margins high and showing other stadiums and other venues that we can achieve that. Yes, you, sometimes it's incremental steps, but sometimes you, know, you need to prove that you could make broad leaps and, and help you know, partner up. So you know, a number of the stadiums that we have worked with, it's really building that roadmap. I heard somebody mention that kind of on the energy side. We do that also on the waste side to kind of accelerate that. And how do, can you do that? and maybe make a minor investment up front, but get that payback, that ROI, uh, very quickly within that. So those are the successes that, that we enjoy and really kind of, you know, the, the, the uptick of just kind of the involvement has just flourished over the years. You know, three years ago, you know, we were just starting to talk to, to, to many partners. Now we're getting upstream into the operations and not just thought of as kind of that that, that trash dock uh, supplier or so on. We're, we're truly a partner in trying to elevate that in the space as well. Great. Well, in the interest of uh, finishing up on time today, I think we're going to move to see if we've got a couple of questions from uh, audience members here. So uh, I see one hand in the back. Tell us who you are. You know, for, from our standpoint, you know, waste management's in, investing in the infrastructure. The, you know, the current infrastructure for recycling everything just doesn't exist. Everybody would love to just have one container, throw it all away, and it's nice and easy. When we look at the organics in, in nature, you know, across the country, there's not one standard as well, and there's not just the infrastructure. Waste management's investing. We have over 40 different uh, uh, investments and partnerships to look at, okay, you know, the solution may be kind of organics diversion today and, and composting, but can you use that as a green energy source? Can, you, can, that, can we create green chemicals? And we have the, those investments in new technologies and looking at that infrastructure. Also looking at, you know, the items that, that we, we discard or we think we can recycle. So your plastic bottles, you know, a PET bottle has a number one or sometimes you have other containers that are a number two. Those are readily, you know, recyclable. But even though you know we have the other numbers on there, you may see a five or six or seven out there, and it's got the recycling symbol, but it's not as easy to recycle. So it's working with partners and vendors at looking at ways of redesigning those materials and also looking at new technologies. We have a technology that looks at it, that, or an investment that we've we've partnered with to to look at those those waste plastics, as I'd say, or the plastics that, that typically don't have the value and, and creating more value from that. So either creating a sweet crude oil from, the, from those plastic materials or creating a new energy source that can get us off of coal and that can burn more efficiently. It's really, you know, our investments looking at all those materials and showing that, you know, 
I think, you know, Seattle Mariner said instead of calling it a trash room, you know, it's a resource room. You know, there's value in all those different materials. We may not have all that value captured today, but it's investing in the infrastructure and so on, so we can have that value. Now, when you have those marathon events or other things, I know many, many industries have tried to set standards or, or they've butted heads with maybe their local provider that, you know, why can't you recycle this? I need to hit my numbers. And I think that's where the, some of the partnerships, some of the solutions, also looking at based on where you're at, what is the supply chain, what are the, the, how can you work with your vendors to maybe change either the cups, the materials that are coming into your stadium or facility to help it help along on the back end. And that's, that's where waste management has really provided some leadership within that and, and, and partnering to kind of help you design the inflow so you can manage kind of the outflow. Mary Ann or Drew, you have any thoughts on the variability issue? Um, you know, it's really about our products are, are recyclable in terms of the um, recycling system that's in there, that's out today. And you really have to look at the low hanging fruit. Um, you've heard from folks that are in from the Seattle area that, you know, it's way, way different than Oklahoma, right? So we're all over the board. Uh, we have venues that are all over the board. Um, but from a plastic standpoint, and, and uh, Tom mentioned plastic, you get one through seven. It's pretty simple. The number on the, the bottle or the can or whatever it is, the container, is about what type of plastic it is. And if it has value, someone will sort it and we'll, we'll, we'll buy it. If it doesn't have value, then they won't. So we focus on, we focus the efforts just recently on our plant bottle as an example. So new technology to figure out how to make a plastic bottle that's still PET at a different material. Um, we did, uh, in the last two years, we did 10 billion bottles worldwide. Small number, 10 billion, right? That's just like a drop in the bucket for us. Then you got to build a supply chain behind it. But what that says is you've got to use the infrastructure you have. We could have built any kind of bottle. Doesn't make sense. The industry set to, to recycle this bottle, a number one plastic bottle, and then make other things out of it. So we work on those kind of things to make sure it's working within the infrastructure that's out there. And recycling, whether it's in a venue or, or in your home or whatever it is, is low-hanging fruit. So recycling is the first, the easiest thing to do. Then you get into composting and everything else. And we have lots of times people want to talk to us about, you know, how can you, you know, compostable cups. It's like you're not even in doing recycling yet. You've got to figure out how to do the bottles and cans first, and then we'll move on to that, right? And all that comes with consumer education. So back of house and front of house are two different things. We've done our homework behind the scenes. Um, our, our physical plants are at 94% waste diversion, right? So we can go talk to people about it. But that's the stuff you do behind the scenes. So what the fun part for us is to work with is sport venues and places like that, where once you put a bottle or can in somebody's hand, you gotta figure out what, they, what are they gonna do with it? And how easy can you make them to recycle? And then how do we get that back in the value chain for us? How do we get that back into making new cans? Cans are real easy. Plastic is very difficult. It has to be food grade quality to get into our products. You just can't put any old plastic in there. It doesn't work so well, right? You're going to drink out of it. We want to make sure it's the right plastic. So partnering with people to make uh, chairs out of, you know, the Navy chair that's made out of 111 bottles. Pretty cool. Making shirts out of it. Making jackets, right? The Turner Field, Atlanta Braves, every one of their game day employees wears a shirt made out of recycled bottles. 60,000 bottles going to make in their uniforms. And that's something that they got excited about. And guess what? We tell them that on the outside so people are excited about it. So there's ways to, to turn products into other things. But some materials don't have so much value. Right? So as a business person, you got to understand that if it doesn't have value, nobody's going to sort it out. Nobody's going to go to that effort. Nobody's going to try to put it back into material. Oil has value. Wait a second. Shh, don't <laughs> use my Oil lines. has <laughs> value. I want to answer the one second. I want to answer the gentleman's question directly. Sir, if you, you, you run a mass, you know, populous event and there's oil, call 1-800-669-5840, ask for Drew, they all know me, and we'll come get that oil. Because that's, that is a, that is a, yeah, that's got a big value to us. And oil can be just, keep in mind, oil can be recycled over and over again. Like See somebody oil. burning the oil, please tell them you don't have to do that. Natural gas, a whole lot cheaper, okay? The oil can be recycled over and over again. And, uh, and let me just throw this one other thing before I answer your question. And that is that the oil that we collect, and I'll, I'll pick on Brandon again because he's a racetrack owner here in, the, here in the room. The oil that we collect at Brandon's race in two weeks, 
We're going to take to our refiner in East Chicago, Indiana, on the outskirts of Chicago, and then we're going to bring it back to Brandon so he could use it in his trucks and his vehicles. So the snow that he plows during the winter is going to come from Jeff Gordon's oil that he that he, Jeff ran in his race car in uh, in August at his racetrack. So we we take the oil back to the racetrack. So you know, talk about sustainability and a closed loop system. There you go. And then we give it back by putting it back in the fence. Yeah, yeah, then you, then you do it again. All right, well, I think we have just time for one more question. Okay, sorry. Um, Jennifer with ADG, Urban Environmental Programs. So I've got um, venues that have incredible success stories and venues that have challenge stories. So today we talked a lot about the role of sports and to tell the positive stories. And we talked a little bit about people who are afraid to greenwash and won't tell any story. And we started to talk about transparency, but that's what I wanted to get to is what's the value or the role of the challenge story? And the transparency story, where you know we have, we're all sharing our successes, but what is the role of where we only have a 35 percent conversion, or we only had a 4 percent conversion? And with your experience as organizations that have had to deal a lot with transparency, what would your advice be to our industry, which isn't being forced to put our nutrition label on our buildings about how much energy we're using and whatnot? Grow up. <laughs> yeah, grow up. Do it. You know, it's easy. There's nothing complicated about doing it. This, this gentleman and this lady will send the army, and I'll send the army too. I got two of them right here. And they'll go out there this afternoon and show you how to recycle any kind of fluid waste you have. I, th yeah. I, I think most importantly, it's um, starting the process, right? So we, sometimes we, we call it making chicken salad out of chicken something else, right? But you can find a story. And I, I think the, um, that's the most important part. So sometimes we talk about diversion. Sometimes we like to talk about containers. So like normal consumers don't deal with, like I recycled, you know, 22 pounds. It's like, what, the hell, what does that mean, right? We talk about containers. So when you tell somebody we did almost 12 million containers at NASCAR over two years, you can deal with a container, right? You don't deal with pounds, but you got to start somewhere. And part mm -hmm. of the exposing the, hey, here's what we did and here's our results is that becomes, an, how do you do it better? And sometimes it's, um, it'll give you an interesting story. So like uh, Atlanta Braves, we've been working with them for the last three or four years. And metrics are one of the things that we talk about as one of the most important parts, right? You gotta have bins, you gotta have them in the right place, you gotta have consumers do something. But if you don't have metrics, you don't have anything because that's the first question that somebody really asks. Like, it's, um, the, you know, well, it's great you put this recycling program in, what are you doing? Um, what happens also in the sports world is sometimes you don't have as many butts in the seats every year. Right? Or it rains a lot. Right? If you don't have a closed dome stadium, it rains a lot, games get canceled, all kind of funky things happen, weather. Um, so your volume might be down. So if you said last year I recycled 1,000 containers and this year I cycled 500, does that mean you did worse? Maybe not. So you, gotta under you just have to spin the story. And it's not spinning the story, it's about telling a story because you want to grow from that. Right? The only way you can go is up. Um, but I think that's a, that's a key piece. Tom, do you have a quick yeah, thought? I, I always liken, you know, sustainability as a journey. And, and uh, you know, the best stories are those journeys of change. And, you know, waste management's been transforming itself. You know, many of you think of us maybe initially as just a waste and landfill company. We're an energy company. We're a new technology company. And it, we've led that transformation. We, we, you know, I'd say, you know, if you're stuck in a rut, if you've been trying to do it on your own, there's many partners around the table here today. There's many partners out there for you to kind of reach out and get that support and help you along that journey. You can do it on your own, but there are many solutions out there that have been developed, success stories that you may need to just kind of tweak you along the way to help you on that journey. And it's, it's continuing along that path, that perseverance that you see within sports is important, and kind of take on that, that, that same uh, you know, mindset as you try to embark on that. Uh, you know, you're always gonna run into roadblocks. We're on a journey ourselves. You know, we, we don't have those recycling centers or facilities everywhere, we, you know, just based on the, the previous point. So I think it's a journey that we're all on together it's a, and, and in coming together in, in forums like this, you know, reaching out to one another, measuring, all those aspects help, and there's steps along the way. Sometimes you could go leaps and bounds. Other times, you know, it's learning from those struggles that helps us succeed, so. Well, just in wrapping up the panel, uh, let me say that uh, we at EPA are 
very excited about the progress that's been made so far and really looking forward to enhancing the partnerships as this moves forward. We're looking forward to the summit in Seattle coming up uh, in September. And uh, you all saw this morning the commitment of our administrator to this cause. Uh, she's a sports fan. Uh, many of us at EPR are, are big fans. And it's this kind of engagement, these kind of partnerships that we really want to build on and make uh, more effective going forward. And uh, we're competitive, too. Uh, I have to brag a little bit about uh, the fact that the Green Sports Alliance and some of the uh, initiators of this uh, came out of the Northwest, uh, where my Region 10 is located. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to get my other nine regional administrators to compete with us uh, as, as this moves forward as well. So look forward to continuing the partnership. And uh, good on you guys for everything you're doing. We've got a fantastic closing speaker that's going to wrap this up, and I, I just want to take a quick uh, moment to thank uh, Stephanie Owens and her team at EPA, the entire EPA team, for, for all the work they've done. Uh, Alan Hershkowitz and the team from NRDC again, and, and Martin. Uh, Tull and, and the team from Green Sports Alliance, you guys have been fantastic. We've taken Ann's from Biceps uh, suggestion and, and, and taken it to heart, and we have invited uh, Ovi uh, Muhaley, who is just a, a fantastic, dynamic speaker, on uh, the importance of, uh, of the green sports movement. And Ovi is a, is a fullback uh, in the NFL, uh, and the passion that he brings uh, to the game of football is equaled only by his off-the-field passion for empowering kids, uh, empowering communities, and especially those in underserved communities. And uh, just recently, Ovi was named a top five eco-athlete by Planet Green, and he's the founder of the Ovi Mohaley uh, Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that empowers kids by educating them about the environment and gives them a platform to transform their own households, their own neighborhoods, their own communities and the entire world. And by creating a unique foundation in the green space, Ovi and his, uh, and his team have combined fun things that can, kids can do uh, and can relate to, like football, with uh, educational programs and practical information about going green. Uh, pro bowler, Ovi Mahaley. Wow, wow, wow. It is truly an honor to be here. I've sat there for the last couple of hours and just been so excited, so happy, just, just so overjoyed to, to be at this place right now. Like uh, my man from the Eagles mentioned earlier, I'm not environmentalist. You know, I'm, I'm a, a football player and I, I enjoy that and I like video games and you know, I go out and, you know, I, I really don't, I don't hike much or, Love the, the spotted owl, or look at you know different animals in the rainforest. Like I was never a big you know tree hugger type of environmentalist person that understood or really cared about it. Um, that changed when I had my first child. And that completely changed because the amount of responsibility that comes with that is enormous. I became more than just a football player. I became a father, and that was my number one job. That was my priority. And I, I understood that I have to do more than just take care of me. I have to do everything I can to take care of my little one. I have a three-year-old and a two-month-old. And part of that includes giving her her best chance at life, giving her a chance to, to go outside, have the same clean air, clean water that I have 20, 30, 40 years from now. And I found out I can use sports to do that. Sports is powerful. Sports is real powerful. People don't understand how sports can just transform, change, and take over people's lives. I mean, if you, when I come out to the stadiums, I was with the Falcons for five years, I come out to the stadium, I see all types of people. I see, you know, tall, short, narrow, little wider people, you know. I see all types of uh, socioeconomic classes, lawyers and doctors, people who, uh, construction workers, all there, all root for the same team. It's, it's like, it's crazier than having you know, Republicans and Democrats together. It's just everybody all together rooting for the same team. They don't care who they are. For a big play or a big win, they'll start hugging each other, jumping up and down, excited and everything, and they realize that they don't know the person that they're, they're hugging, but they're excited about their team. And in, in the same uh, um, aspect, if they lose, 
I feel bad if we lose a game as a player. These fans take it like it is, it is the end of the world. I, I had a fan tell me that they missed work for a whole week after we lost to the Saints. And I, I understand. I know Lisa Jackson, this was a Saints fan. I understand uh, losing to the Saints is tough, but you got to you gotta pick it up. You know, you, gotta, you can't take it that bad. But, but um, on the flip side, uh, the Saints is also an example of the power of sports and how they used it to heal their city and heal their surrounding, surrounding area. When Katrina happened, when the oil spill happened, the New Orleans Saints did an amazing job of using sports to heal that area. Drew Brees, all the players, they went out there, they let the fans know that we're a part of you. We're here to help you. We want to do whatever we can to, to inspire you, to motivate you, to let you understand that you're not going through this alone. And the heroes that you see on TV, the heroes that you, know, that you uh, look up to and that, that give you so much joy, you know, we're just like you. We're here to help you. If we can do it, you can do it, and we're going to do it together. Those type of sentiments show the power of sports. And it is that power that I wanted to harness when I started my foundation. I knew that there are several kids out there who had no idea what going green is. They had no idea what, you know, why it was important to be involved in the environment, why it's important to uh, recycle or, or do things like that. It was just not an issue for them. In fact, they had other issues like you know, uh, poverty, hunger, bullying, all types of issues to where the environment wasn't something even on their radar. But what we found out is that the kids who care the least about the environment are the ones affected the most by the environment. The, the kids who are, are too cool for or got too much going on, that they have the landfills in their neighborhood and the coal plants in their neighborhood, and they're affected by negative effects by the, of the environment, such as asthma. Uh, Atlanta, where, my, my, where I live, asthma is all over the place. It's one of the highest places for highest rates of asthma in the country in Atlanta. And kids go around not knowing what's going on, not knowing why they're dealing with this, and not given any tools to try and fix it. So the first part to fixing it is educating them. And if you don't know, football is a great way to bring people together, including kids. My foundation, we do everything from football camps to uh, green speaker series to uh, eco champion clubs to uh, recycle on the run. Like, we just try whatever way we can to get kids involved. At these football camps, we have kids who they, they see over Mahaley and see like the, my teammates I'm bringing, like Michael Turner and Roddy White, and they, you know, they, they get excited and they come to the camp. I tell them, uh, you guys didn't read the last part of the uh, title. It's the Over Mahaley Football Camp and Eco Workshop. <laughs> it's like, what's an Eco Workshop, Mr. Mahaley? I said, close them, lock the doors. So let, me, let me tell these kids. <laughs> so, so once they're in there, I tell them, I'm going to be teaching you about a carbon footprint. I'm going to be teaching you about water quality, about air quality, about, about how to recycle, about what composting is. I'm going to be teaching you how you can make money for your parents and save money for your parents. I'm like, I don't want to hear about that. But I was like, all right, but I have incentives. And the incentives was mentioned earlier, and for kids, it is a must to get them excited. Once they get excited, once that, that enthusiasm comes, it, it's like a snowball effect. It keeps on rolling, it keeps on going. We do everything from having um, we have an environmental jeopardy game to uh, the recycle and run. Let me explain the recycle and run to you. Um, we have eco chip. We have we have uh, classrooms before we go outside and play football, where they get taught all the things about the environment and they learn all the lessons. Then when they go outside, recycle and run is where you recycle while you're running. It's an obstacle course where kids get to do football drills. They get to run over this, jump over that, you know, hit pads. But they have different environmental brain teasers throughout where they have to stop and, and, and use their mind and figure out there's a whole bunch of trash on the ground. That's not good. We got to recycle it. We got to put it in the right bin. But is this item recyclable? Is it reusable? Is it you know, paper, plastic? Is it compostable? And look at the back of the, of the bottle. Wait, I learned this earlier. Mr. Mahaley told me if I pay attention that I could win a prize. And the team that has the fastest times wins everything from solar iPhone chargers to you know, different green uh, type of uh, technology and gear. And they love it. And the reason I know they love it, because the first year was, was tough, I'll admit. But the second and third and fourth year, kids came back. Kids kept on tell, were telling me that I know what a carbon footprint is. And I told my daddy this. And I'm creating those kids that bug the heck out of you and tell you guys 
this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do, no dad do like this, no mom do like that, that's what I'm creating, you know? One of the uh, things the kids love as well is the Green Speaker Series allows kids to see themselves more than what they are now and see the environment as a way to gather situation financially because they never, some of them never knew that there were so many jobs that allowed them to help the planet as well as to make a profit. They didn't even know it existed. But I'll have people from recycling plants come talk to them, people from uh, different energy companies come talk to them, people who work at restaurants and, and are sustain, sustainability coordinators at restaurants. It's like, really? I wanted to be a chef, but this sustainability coordinator, that, that sounds interesting. I did not know that you could do so many things for the environment with the environment. It, it just absolutely blows my mind. These kids need to understand that they have the power. They have the power to change their communities, to change their, their neighborhoods, to change their schools, to change their churches by just spreading the word, letting people know. The same way that with the seatbelts and with smoking, how, you know, it was kids. I remember I was a little kid. I saw the commercials about seatbelts and, and, and smoking. I told them, Mom, if you love me, then you're going to, you know, not smoke and not, you know, roll down the windows or you won't put your seatbelt on because that's what I saw on TV and that's what I heard Emmett Smith say and then this PSA, whatever. I was like, okay, all right. And the parents listen. And it's because of the kids, it's because of the power they have, it's because of them continuing to push their parents. So when that light bulb goes off, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It, it makes my job worthwhile. It makes, you know, being tired after football practice, but on the Tuesdays, our free days, going down to the Boys and Girls Club, working with these kids, talking to them, laughing, joking, teaching, you know, testing them, it makes it all worthwhile. Now, it's, it's great that I'm able to do what I can through my foundation, but I, I need help. I, I need help through the sports industry. And the way that the sports industry can help is by doing some of the things that the NFL is already doing. They have a great program called Fuel Up to Play 60, which is all about encouraging kids to eat healthy as well as to work out for 60 minutes a day. And if they do so, they get different game, uh, different prizes, or they have a player come visit them at school. It's a great program. We need more. The NFL also does a reforestation process where after every super, during every Super Bowl, they plant trees and they track the environmental, um, the positive effects of the environment that these trees have years and years to come. That's great. We need more. What I really, really want to happen, and it's been mentioned several times, but why don't we use athletes to, to go out there and push it, is what the NBA is doing everybody should be doing with the Green Week. A Green Week is a way to have every team, every fan, in every industry see how important the environment is to these players. I've been actually you know, behind the scenes trying to work some things out. I've been talking to Arthur Blank, talking to the mayor of Atlanta. I've been working with my buddy George Bennett from U.S. Green Building Council and trying to, to make this happen because I know that I'm a thousand percent sure that if you get these players, you get you know, the, um, the Peyton Mannings of the world, and you get you know, the Drew Brees of the world, you get all these people to have a green week and say that, hey, you know, I I'm so-and-so, and, -so and, and, and I, I support going green, this is why I support it, and have these players go out and do service projects, have their uh, either jerseys, rich bands made of organic uh, material, organic cotton, have t-shirts for sale that benefit different environmental companies, it's going to work, it's going to sell, and it'll be a big hit for not only the players, not only the organization, not only the fans, even the corporations will make money off it. Nike has green elements to it. Coca-Cola obviously has huge green and recycling elements to it. Everybody can join in, everybody can make money and make a difference. And that's what we all want in the end. We all want to make a difference and we all want to have a legacy that lasts beyond us just being here. Now, I, I've been very blessed to play the NFL for 10 years. I've had some, some great games against the Saints, had some great wins down there. <laughs> I've, I've been named All-Pro twice. I've, I've gone to the Pro Bowl and been considered the best at my position in the whole world, which is, is, is flabbergasting to me. And, and I never thought a little boy from, from Charleston, South Carolina, you know, would get, grow up to you know, be a professional football player. 
my dad was a doctor, my mom has a master's in business, and I was gonna, um, my sister's a, a doctor too. And I was pre-med as well, and I was just sitting there in college, just had my MCAT book and was gonna do something in the medical field. And my coach was like, you know that uh, we have some football coaches out there who wanna work you out? I was like, you sure? Nah, I don't want, there's four of them out there. Really? I closed the book, put it on the bed, never saw it again, but you know, if I want to pull it out, I still can. But I, I've, just, I've just loved this ride I've been on with the NFL and th this opportunity that I've, I've had to do so many great things, have so many great experiences, but it's going to fade at one point. At one point, People aren't going to remember how many Pro Bowls I had. They're not going to remember the touchdowns I caught in New Orleans. They're not going to remember, you know, uh, some of the great things that I've done. But the, stuff, the thing that no one can take away from me is what I'm doing with the environment, is the kid that I touch, that I affect, the kid that understands that, hey, if Mr. Mihaly can do it, maybe I can do it. The, the, kid, the kid that sees a future in the environment or, or in green business because of me and tells another kid, or tells his parent, tells a friend, and has that whole ripple effect. No one can take that away from me. No one can change that. And I always tell people that it's going to be the best feeling in the world when my daughter gets of age in 10 or 15 years and comes up to me and said, you know, Dad, I'm really proud of you. You know, I'm so proud of you, what you've done. You took your gift, you took your talent, you took your status and you used it to give me a better life. You used it to give me you know, a, a chance to, to have the same clean air, clean water, the same facilities, the same earth that you had. You could have been selfish and said, I'm good, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do something else, but you did something that is helping me and is helping everybody. And that's hands down what I'm be most proud of. And I think that's the reason we, no, we need to use sports, we need to use the power of sports, and we need to use all the resources around us to make sure we attack this problem and attack it now. I commend every single one of you here because you are all rock stars in the business. And I think someone made a, uh, uh, <laughs> a comment earlier about how I need to put some of the prettier faces out here, you know, in front of uh, the people so to help sell the movement. Not saying that I'm a pretty face, but yeah, <laughs> I do all right. But really, you guys are amazing. And I want to say that I thank you. You're the reason I'm up here. Um, some of you in here I've spoken to several times and are my mentors, and I follow you and, and, and am encouraged by what you do. And if you keep on doing this, bigger than any game of football or any game around the league, the, this whole green game will be won by us. Thank you. Thank you.